What started out as simple curiosity, what is this paranormal activity in this house, has now turned into something that goes way beyond simple paranormal encounters. Every time I identify who these spirits are, more spirits come forward. They want us to listen to them, and the more I listen to them, the stronger the activity becomes. In this chapter of Ghost Chronicles, I'll investigate two more names that came up in the first year when this all started. And I'll end up looking at pure evil face to face. There's a lot of things that happens behind the scenes when I do these investigations. I don't always mention all the names and I don't always talk about what happened during some investigations. During the first year when these investigations started, there were multiple names that were coming up. There were so many names coming up, I couldn't even keep track of all of them. But while doing these investigations in the Logan, Naomi, Rachel, Anna, there was another name that was coming up. And that's the name of Jennifer. What's your name? These spirits kept bringing her name up. Eventually, I started investigating into who Jennifer was. What's wrong with her? Why is she here? When I found Naomi Mitchell's murder online, there was also another murder in Carmel that came up. In July of 1977, James Hicks murders his wife where they lived at the TNN trailer park in Carmel, Maine. Hicks claims Jenny moved to Florida. However, nobody ever hears from Jenny again. Law enforcement could not prove James murdered his wife. They could find no body to make an arrest. Five years later in 1982, just a few miles from Carmel in the town of Newport, Maine, James Hicks goes to a lounge where he meets Gerilyn Towers. Nobody hears from Gerilyn again. Law enforcement knows James Hicks murdered Gerilyn Towers, but again, like Jenny, her body could not be found. October 6, 1983. Hicks is arrested for the murder of his wife, Jenny. This will be the first time in Maine's history someone will face a trial for murder where a body was never found. Hicks is convicted for the murder of Jenny. Unfortunately, he is only given a 10-year sentence. Hicks served six years out of a 10-year sentence. He was released in 1990. On May 25, 1996, Hicks, then-girlfriend Lynn Willette, comes up missing. Once again, Hicks is suspected of Lynn's disappearance, and once again, police could not find Lynn Willette alive or dead. James Hicks moves to Texas. In 1999, Hicks is arrested for the attempted murder of another female. Upon his conviction, Hicks cuts a deal with Maine State Police. He does not want to serve his time in a Texas prison. Hicks confesses to the murders of Jenny, Gerilyn Towers, and Lynn Willette. He tells Maine State Police he strangled all three women. He dismembered his wife, Jenny. However, police could only find Jenny's skull. The rest of her remains were never found. Hicks also dismembered Gerilyn Towers and buried her remains on the property in Etna owned by the Hicks family. This is where Jenny's skull was found. Hicks tells police he murdered Lynn Willette at the Twin City Motel in Brewer. He dismembered Lynn in the basement of the motel, put her body parts in five-gallon buckets, and poured concrete in the buckets. He disposed of her remains in northern Maine. James Hicks was classified as a serial killer and is also a suspect in other unsolved disappearances and murders. Out of curiosity, I go to the TNN trailer park. Since 1977, the park has been vacated and piles of debris lay on the grounds. This is where Jenny was murdered. This is Hello? I definitely heard a disembodied voice. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
Was this the voice of Jenny, the wife of serial killer James Hicks? What I find really, really amazing with this activity, these spirits in this house have a lot of information. They're like an encyclopedia of information. I don't know how they know what they know. I don't know if they observe everything that goes on in Carmel or if these are people that was around when these events took place. But I go ahead and try to find out if these spirits know anything about Jennifer and if they have information, this will help confirm what they are trying to tell me. So I conduct an investigation into asking these spirits if they knew anything about Jennifer or James Hicks. The results were quite shocking. Yeah, I'm here. Do any of you know where James Hicks is at right now? At that moment, I am standing there thinking, no doubt, these spirits are intelligent. They are fully aware of me and call me out by name. When you clearly hear a spirit say your name, this does give you a troubling feeling. You begin to question what are these spirits? What kind of spirits are we encountering? They know who James Hicks is. They are aware he's in prison. How do they know this? What? Jenny, is that you that's saying help? These spirits are going to say something. At the time, I didn't know what they meant by this. Two years later, these spirits will bring up Bob again, and they do claim James Hicks murdered Bob. Does you, do any of you other ghosts know if James Hicks has killed more than just the three women that he confessed to? Is there more victims that he killed? <laughs> I assumed everything these spirits were telling me about James Hicks and Jenny was based on the fact that there were other victims they wanted me to know about. So that's the direction I took this investigation. I go to a cemetery in Etna. I had doubts that I would capture anything there, but I thought maybe it was worth a try. If there are any spirits there, maybe they might know something about James Hicks or Jennifer, since James Hicks was in the same town as Etna. So I go there, and once again, I'm surprised. Do any of you know who James Hicks is? <laughs> Do you guys know if there's any more victims to James Hicks? Is it possible there are remains of another victim killed by James Hicks somewhere in the waters around Brewer? Possibly close to the Twin City Motel where he worked? I wanted to take this investigation back to the TNN trailer park. 
I had no idea what lot the Hicks trailer sat on. There was a documentary that came out on James Hicks, and in that documentary showed the actual trailer. Eventually I was able to find the exact location where Jenny lived, where James Hicks murdered her, his wife. In the late night hours of 1977, James Hicks strangles Jenny to death in the living room of their home. Once trailer park closed down, over the years the former home belonging to the Hicks has decayed and now lays in a pile of rubble on the concrete foundation. The garage remained intact. What I found strange, there were belongings stored in the garage. These items look to date back to the 1970s. So I go back to the TNN trailer park to conduct an investigation. I wasn't sure if I'd capture anything related to James Hicks or Jenny because the last time I went there, it seemed like some of the spirits from this house followed me and that's when I encountered these spirits talking about suicide. But this is what took place when I found the exact location. So I am picking up some energy readings on this K2 meter. Did you die right where I'm standing? Every time I step in this area right in here, for some reason I get lightheaded. Where I'm standing in this exact spot was the living room Jenny was murdered in. Is there somebody right in here right now? I'm going to step into the garage. The moment I step into this garage, instantly my chest tightens up and I get a really heavy feeling something is very wrong. It felt like I entered a room where pure evil dwelled hiding in dark corners. My stomach tightens as if I was going to vomit. At the time I didn't understand why I felt this way, but after going over the recordings it all made sense. My human spirit was clashing with pure dark energy. Did you die on this property? How did you die? There was definitely something in that garage that did not feel right. I felt extremely grieved inside. And when I say grieved inside, I'm talking about it felt like in my chest was just squeezing really tight with, with grief. 
There was no doubt something was evil in that garage. And when that voice said evil, that was a disembodied voice right in my face. It wasn't as loud as what the camera picked up. I was quite surprised when I looked, viewed the recording, it was that loud. But that thing was right in my face and said evil. Now, I don't know if that was an evil spirit or if that was a spirit that was warning me that was, there was evil there. But it did startle me. After viewing the recordings, Adam was going to go with me back to the tin and trailer park at night. Based on what I felt in that garage, I did not want to go alone. So Adam accompanies me and we go back to the tin and trailer park. Whoa. Is there anybody out here, please? Did you hear that? Mm -hmm. well, this is an actual piece of the mobile home here. This garage. James Hicks strangles Jenny to death in the living room of their home. Wow. Wow, somebody's ransacked this since I was here last. I was going to say when I was just walking in the grass, it looks like someone's been out here recently. Like someone's been out here, like someone's been out here, like someone's been out here. Is anybody in this garage, please? Hello? Once again, while in that garage, something just didn't feel right. Once again, I felt that grieving feeling. I really didn't want to go back to that garage ever again. You could tell something really bad happened there. Something wasn't right. Okay, right over in here, I picked up a disembodied voice. Hear that? that night, Adam and I made a decision to go ahead and do an investigation here in the house. We were going to do it on a Friday night. So Adam comes over to the house and we conduct an investigation here in the house. And at this point in time, I set the Jenny investigation aside. I didn't like what I was feeling from it. So I went ahead and put it on the back burner and thought maybe me and Adam can do an investigation here in this house. But things take a turn and I think that, in my opinion, what I encountered in that garage at the TNN trailer park may have followed me back to this house. Anybody in here? Adam will be here tonight.
Hello? Hope you guys say something or do something. Oh my god! No! Oh. When I saw this thing across the room staring at me, we made eye contact. Although the camera showed this to be dark in nature, what I saw looked like a mist of gray smoke in the form of a person. For a brief moment, this thing split into three sections. One section went through the wall, another section went to the right, and took the shape of an animal form. The section that went through the wall clearly looked like a human with no hair, no eyes, and looks to be wearing human clothing. I don't believe this is a human spirit, but this wasn't the only thing captured. At the bottom of the stairs was another apparition. You guys say something or do something. Oh my God, no. This one had a strange shaped head. Although the screenshot is very poor, if you look closely, you can make out its features. An ear, eyebrows, eyes, nose, and what looks like a long goatee. But this happened so fast, for a moment I thought I was hallucinating and imagined this. When I stopped and went back into the room and didn't see anything, I was convinced this was in my imagination. When Adam came to the house, I showed him the recording. I was hesitant to do the investigation this night, but Adam was looking forward to this investigation. On this same night, other apparitions were captured in the basement. Hope you guys say something or do something. Oh my god! No! Oh. Okay, that was a weird noise, and I know damn well I saw a shadow thing standing right there. I know, damn it. See? I can't be too loud because there's people downstairs, and I don't want them to know what's going on up here. Holy crap and crap. Are you mad at me? And don't forget, we're probably picking up EVPs too.
okay. <laughs> I was like, okay, that was a pretty good knock. I've heard him that loud before. The night when Adam came to the house to do the investigation with me, he was telling me about a location in Levant. It was called Dead Man's Curve, and they named it this because of numerous people killed on this road. And there are also two cemeteries at this location. Therefore, it got the nickname Dead Man's Curve. And I thought it was strange because a week before Adam tells me this, another Carmel resident also told me about Dead Man's Curve in Levant. This location was nicknamed Dead Man's Curve due to the amount of people killed in car accidents. People drove their cars at a high rate of speed, lost control of their vehicles, they crashed into trees. Some of these people died within a small cemetery located right at this curve. You can see on these trees that cars have crashed into these multiple times. Another fatality accident happened on this tree right here where somebody crashed into it and their car ended up over there and they did die. But you can tell that a car's come in this area before and tore this fencing up. I thought this was a really strange story. I talked with town officials to verify these accidents at this curve. A gentleman at the fire department confirmed a number of people have died as a result of auto accidents, but he couldn't confirm how many. When I looked up young adults and teen suicides in Maine, the location in Levant known as Dead Man's Curve came up. I read an article from March 1998. It states, A weekend highway crash that killed two 16-year-old honor students from Central High School has been ruled a suicide. Right there where my car is sitting is where the fatal accident was on March 28th. March 27th, 1998. Police found a suicide note in the car that crashed into a clump of trees Friday night on Dead Man's Curb in Levant. Okay, based on the accident report, their vehicle went straight on this road right here and over 100 miles an hour and crashed in this area right in here. There were no skid marks. The bodies of the two best friends, Cass Roberts of Corinth and Emily Stupak of Stetson, were discovered in the wreckage Saturday morning. What I thought was strange, the night Adam told me about this, we did the investigation in the basement. During this investigation, the faint voice of a female was captured. Help me. Then the voice of a male says, Cass. <laughs> I wasn't sure if this was a coincidence. In all honesty, I really didn't want to conduct another investigation into a suicide victim because when I did the investigation into Logan, that was devastating. But I felt like there was a reason why these spirits were bringing her name up. Off camera, I'd hear the disembodied voices say Cass's name. I decided to do an investigation in this house since I'm hearing her name brought up. What do these spirits know about her? What do they have to say about this? So I conduct an investigation. March 27th of 1998, in Levant, two girls died. Does anybody know who they are? other ghosts no Cass Roberts
you ghosts know how they died, how the two died on March 27th, 1998. Cass and Emily, this Friday I'm going to the bank where you guys died. Meet me out there. Based on what these spirits said, I had doubts that Cass committed suicide. If what these spirits are saying is true, I needed to go to Levant and continue the investigation to get confirmation. And I have no doubt that was Cass who said, who asked if she died. I don't think she knew she was dead. I have found when encountering these spirits, to them, when they died, it may seem like an hour, two hours, three hours went by, maybe a day or two. But to us, it could be weeks, months, or years. Because spirits don't have a concept of time. We do. In her mind, she could have just had the accident, and the next thing she knows, she's here at this house. And why she's at this house, I don't know. Levant connects to the town of Carmel. But at this point in time, I don't fully understand how is it possible that she's at this house? Or is she just in a realm and there's a portal in this house that she can communicate through? These are questions that will later be answered. So when I asked these spirits to meet me in Levant on Friday, unfortunately, I couldn't make it on that Friday. Things came up and I couldn't go. I don't like telling these spirits that I'm going to do something and not do it. So I told them I will be going on the next Friday. And usually I conduct the investigations on Fridays because that's when I either have the house alone or that's when I have the opportunity to be able to do these investigations was on Fridays because nobody's home in the house. I have the car to myself so it's easier to set these investigations up on that particular day. But the second Friday came around, once again, I wasn't able to make it. I was frustrated that I couldn't make it again. But finally, I had an opportunity to make it to Levant, and it wasn't on a Friday. So I finally make it to Levant. I find the locations where Cass and Emily died. There was two crosses sitting in the background and one cross sitting towards the front. I pull out my equipment and I'm getting set up to go ahead and start the investigation. I am standing in the exact spot where Emily and Cass were killed on March 27th, 1998. Their vehicle impact this tree right here. Once I started recording and started rolling, all of a sudden this car pulls up behind my car it had New Jersey tags on, and the lady gets out of her car and starts walking towards me. I shut the camera off, and I'm like, okay, I need to go ahead and shut this down. I'm not sure who this is, but I need to find out what they want. The lady starts talking with me and asked me what I was doing, and I told her that I was filming a documentary about Dead Man's Curve, and... There were two girls that was killed right here, and I wanted to do a documentary on them because this was supposed to be a suicide based on what the newspaper said. And then I told her, I said, I had doubts this was a suicide, but I'm doing an investigation on it. She told me that 
Cass was her daughter. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. What do I say to her? I mean, I can't tell her that I'm doing a paranormal investigation and that I heard from her daughter. I mean, she was going to think I'm some Lulu. I asked her if she believed in ghosts, if she believes in the afterlife. She said she absolutely does. I told her that I don't want you to think I'm crazy, but there's a really good possibility I've encountered your daughter's spirit. And that's why I'm here. I'm conducting this investigation into Cass. And I don't believe she committed suicide. Her mother looked at me and responded and said, I don't believe that either. She said things about Cass that caused me to have even more doubts that this was a suicide. I talk with Cass's mother for a few minutes. She tells me about Cass. She was an honor student and had goals for her future. She had a very bright future that she was working towards her goals into her young adulthood. Usually when young adults like that or teens are suicidal, usually their grades go down, they lose ambitions and they don't have goals because in their mind they are living in a hopeless state. This wasn't Cass. I'm beginning to think now these spirits are correct and without a doubt I have encountered Cass. And she said, when I brought up these, the fact that there was a suicide note found in the car, she said that was a lie. You guys left a suicide note. When you smashed your car into that tree and crashed into the tree, did you intend it on killing yourselves? <laughs> So now I'm very interested in opening up this investigation. I asked Cass's mother, I said, I don't know what you think about spirit boxes, but I do hear from spirits when I use this device. Especially if they know how to use that device, they will talk. So Cass's mother joined me in a spirit box session right in front of the crosses. And I couldn't believe what happened. Is there anybody out here right now that would like to speak with us? There is no doubt in my mind when Cass's mother and I met each other at the location where her daughter died, this was not a coincidence. In fact, Cass's mother said she wasn't even going to Dead Man's Curve. She was on her way some other place, but went down the wrong road. And since she was down the wrong road, she decided to go ahead and stop there at Dead Man's Curve to, to see the crosses. This wasn't planned on her part. I was just standing here thinking about Cass. You pulled up. And you're Cass's mother. That's, what are the odds of that? Yeah, it's I mean, no co coincidence. And I looked back and I remembered how I couldn't make it the dead man's curve on the days I wanted to make it there. And all of a sudden, the day I can make it, the timing when I ran into Cass's mother, that's not a coincidence. There's no way that's a coincidence. There is definitely something supernatural involved with this. Cass, I'm by myself now. There's nobody here but me. Cass, I've come to talk to you about what happened on March 27th, 1998. Okay.
past, was this a suicide? Did you have intentions on killing yourself? Based on what these spirits are saying, I got the confirmation I needed. Something happened that night that caused these girls to crash that car. I come back to Dead Man's Curve for a night investigation. Cass's mother meets up with us. Cass and her mother encounter each other in this investigation. What I'm getting ready to show you is just a very small portion of what happened that night. There was much more that happened. But for privacy reasons between Cass and her mother, I left a lot of it out of the video. But this will give you a little idea of what took place that night. Hi. Hi. It's a girl's voice. Did you want to get closer? Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me okay? My name's Kent. Do you know who's standing next to me in front of me here? This encounter was just beyond amazing. I want to make sure, I'm one that wants confirmation. I want to make sure that what these spirits are telling me is accurate and correct. A lot of times I'll ask the same questions over and over again on different days. A week may go by and I'll ask the same question. If these spirits will give me the same answers, to me that's solid confirmation. So that night when I got home, I do another investigation just to see what these spirits have to say one more time. Pass Roberts, I asked you to meet me here at my house so we can talk. <coughs> Pass, when that car hit the tree, did you guys intend to kill yourselves that night? <coughs> I go back to Dead Man's Curve. I have a long talk with Cass. I say a lot of things to her. She said a few things to me. Based on what she told me, this wasn't just a simple accident. Something happened that night. But I have a long talk with her. And I never heard from her again after that. Are you still here? Are 
A spirit in the house brought up the name of Emily before I ever mentioned her name. In Levant, two girls died. Does anybody know who they are? Before I pay a visit to Dead Man's Curve, another spirit mentioned Cass's name. This confirms to me spirits in the house knew of these girls. The voice of Cass comes up multiple times during this full investigation. Not once did these spirits say this was a suicide. Cass said that's a lie. Other spirits said it was an accident or a car wreck. What happened on March 27, 1998? According to the police report, the girls were traveling down Kandusky Road at a high rate of speed. Here is where the car ended up in the clump of trees. Because there is no skid marks, and an alleged suicide note was found in the car, this was ruled a suicide. But based on what these spirits say, this was an accident. If what these spirits say is true, there is another scenario that may have been overlooked. If the girls were traveling down this road at a high rate of speed, Emily, who was driving the car, due to her age, and her lack of experience in driving, when approaching this curve, she failed to negotiate this sharp turn and ended up crashing the car in the clump of trees. She couldn't react fast enough to apply the brakes. This could be why there were no skid marks. But something in the report really caught my attention. Cass was wearing a seatbelt. If the girls, or at least Cass, were planning on killing themselves by crashing the car into this tree, and this was premeditated, why on earth was Cass wearing her seatbelt? When we get into a car, we put our seatbelts on for our own safety in case of an accident. I don't see how, if Cass intended to die by suicide while in the car this night, why would she be wearing her seatbelt? But why was Emily driving at a high rate of speed? <coughs> Based on my investigation, there was a good possibility someone was chasing these girls that night. Emily was driving at a high rate of speed to get away from this person. There's a lot more to this story, however, we will leave it at that. Rest in peace, girl, okay? Haunted Arizona comes to Maine. One of the places I took them was to the cemetery at Dead Man's Curve. The crosses were gone that belonged to the girls. You couldn't even tell where this accident took place. The, everything was gone. No crosses, no pictures, no mementos, nothing. It was all gone. Although I never heard from Cass ever again, I was curious if these spirits that knew about Cass had anything to say about her. And I kind of wanted a little update about Cass. And what these spirits said once again, I find amazing. Does anybody know about the girls that died here in a car accident? Anybody know about them? Is Cass at peace? The night Adam came to the house, an EVP was captured. A spirit says, go back to that place. 
Right after this, another spirit says, Jennifer. And then another spirit says, Cass. And finally, a female says, help us. I personally believe this was the voice of Jenny. When Cass and her mother made peace, I started looking over the video from TNN Trailer Park that I started the investigation on Jenny. While I was going over that video, once again I heard a voice that said Jenny. I immediately grabbed the camera and start recording. I'm working on the Jenny Hicks video right now and there seems to be a lot of paranormal activity going on in this house. Hello? Jenny, are you in here? Is Jenny in here? I don't fully understand why I'm encountering Jenny. I don't fully understand why these spirits keep bringing her up. But I reopened the investigation before I go back to the TNN trailer park. I go to Etna. I find the land where the Hicks lived, where James Hicks' family lived and owned. I knock on the door and the lady verified this is the land where they found Jenny's skull and the remains of Geraldine Towers. For the first time I learned only Jenny's skull was found. The rest of her remains were never found. I thought that all of Jenny's remains were found, but that's not the case. Now this lady, it's not related to Hicks. The land has been sold since the Hicks had it. And the land doesn't look the same anymore. But I was pointed in the direction where the remains were found. I asked her if I can do an investigation there. That I would be discreet about it. And it would be at night time. Because I didn't want to make a big scene out of this. And she said that's fine. I explained to her what it was about. And told her I was doing a documentary that was paranormal related. And I told her that... I was having some encounters that had to do with Jenny, and I just wanted to get down to the bottom of some things. She told me that I needed to go next door and talk to the lady that lived there because she knew James Hicks, and she had a lot of information she could probably give me. So I go to the neighbors, I knock on the door. This lady comes out from behind the house and approaches me from behind, and she goes, can I help you? And I told her who I was, and I told her that I am working on a documentary related to Jenny and James Hicks. She became hysterical. She started yelling at me. She told me I have no idea what I'm getting involved in, and that it's best that I leave right now. She said that if I do something like this on a documentary, that I would end up like those other victims. 
and she warned me not to get involved, to stay out of it. And she demanded me for, to leave her property. At the time, I took that as a threat. But after I completed the investigation, I don't think she was personally threatening me. I think she knew there was something very evil involved with James Hicks, and there was something very evil about the land. I believe that she was warning me that this is much deeper than anybody realizes, and that James Hicks was involved with some things that were extremely dark. And it turns out she was right, because... What I'm getting ready to encounter on this land, I had to end up packing up the equipment and walk away. Something there was extremely evil on that land. At least where I was at in the section of that land. I go to the former Hicks property in Etna. This is the exact location Jenny's skull was found, along with the skeletal remains of a second victim. At this time, I know there are some spirits following me. I had to quietly come out here, but I'm standing on the actual spot where these girls are buried. But I have to be discreet because there's a person real close to this property that threatened me the other day. And I told the people that now owns this property that I'd be very discreet about it. I'd be in and out really fast. It's raining out. It's raining out. the house looks like out of this because it's not really relevant what's relevant is to where these girls were buried on this property gives me the frickin' creeps. Does anybody know anything about James Hicks? After doing the Cass investigation, I was feeling fine and felt confident I could continue the Jenny investigation without incident. But after standing on the former Hicks land, where murdered victims were found, once again, I felt sick to my stomach, and overwhelming fear consumed me. For no reason I felt a raging anger. That same dark feeling I got from the Hicks garage was back. Once again I put a stop to this investigation. I needed time to put my thoughts and feelings in check before continuing. The soft female voice who says please. Was this the voice of Jenny or another murdered victim by the hands of James Hicks? When I said what's relevant, immediately a female says Jenny. What's relevant is to where. For the next week a major debate was playing out in my mind. Are these encounters nothing but pure demonic entities, playing with my emotions, sucking me in to overwhelm me to a dark state of mind of depression I'd never be able to escape? Or am I actually encountering the ghost of Jenny who's trying to tell me something? But what she's trying to tell me, I'm not listening because of an overwhelming fear I have, causing me to want to walk away and never look back? But then I started thinking about the encounters with Cass. How beautiful it was to hear the voice of her mom telling Cass how much she loves her, 
and the voice of Cass answers back, I love you. This is when I knew I need to focus on the good encounters and cast out these evil encounters from my mind. Love needs to prevail over fear and anger. I believe the encounters I had with Cass saved me from a total mental breakdown I was getting ready to have over these dark encounters. If Jenny or other murdered victims are trying to tell me something, I need to listen to what they are trying to tell me. I go back to the garage at the TNN trailer park to continue this investigation. I'm in the garage that belonged to James Hicks. James Hicks worked in a lot of construction and maintenance. By looking at these materials, a lot of these materials are very old. More than likely dates back to the 1970s. This is more than likely the belongings that belong to James and Jenny Hicks. These clothing articles definitely date back to the 1970s. From what I understand, when Jenny disappeared and James Hick left this trailer that they both lived in, a lot of the belongings were left behind and stored in this garage. Let's face it, this stuff is from the 70s. But what's really strange, Lynn Louette, who was murdered in Brewer, after James Hicks dismembered her body, her body parts was put in buckets and filled with concrete. And what's really eerie here is the number of buckets that's sitting here right now. What's even more strange is this tool right here is used for concrete. Now, it is my understanding that it was a very good possibility James Hicks dismembered Jenny in this garage. Is it possible that he dismembered her and placed her body parts in buckets and then drove the body parts to Etna to dispose of her? Did James Hicks have an evil spirit in him? When I viewed this encounter on the recording, asked if James Hicks had an evil spirit in him, and this spirit said yes, in his stomach. This takes me back to the first time I entered this garage. I felt an overwhelming grieving in my chest, and my stomach tightened up so tight I felt sick. Unknown to me at the time, my human spirit was in fact clashing with an evil spirit, causing this physical sick feeling inside me. Encounters like this will often happen. Eventually you learn when there is in fact a dark encounter with pure evil, you have to trust your gut instinct. Jenny, are you here? There's a very heavy feeling here, and you, ju you can just feel that there's something not right here. It's just a heavy feeling.
When I started this investigation in the Jenny, I had preconceived ideas what this investigation was about. And this preconceived idea was about Jenny and these other spirits wanting to tell me about other victims that James Hicks murdered. I didn't realize what they were telling me was they wanted me to find Jenny's remains. <laughs> something from this investigation. When spirits say things, we have to listen to them very closely to what they are trying to tell us. For unknown reasons, the remains that belong to somebody are important to them. I don't 100% understand why, not at this point in time, during the investigation, but I have learned that when a person dies and they're in the afterlife, a lot of times they become very concerned about where their remains are. I don't know if this was the case with Jenny. Maybe she just wanted everybody to know where she was at. Maybe these other spirits wanted this solved where her remains are at. So I asked these spirits if they can tell me where the rest of Jenny's remains are. Where's Jenny Lynn right now? <laughs> How close is the rest of Jenny's remains to where they found her skull? Can I get confirmation that Jenny's buried in Etna by the town line of Carmel? I really like to get down to the bottom of where Jenny's remains are buried. Do a test, bring the EMF meter or something and see if I get reactions to that spot where they say that the rest of her remains are buried. If you guys really want me to find Jenny's remains, show me. I'm going to Etna to try to locate where Jen Jenny's body's at. guys mentioned it's in, she's in Etna. So I'm bringing my spirit box with me and I'm bringing my EMF meter which has an alarm on it. If I get close to where Jenny's at, please tell me. Set off the EMF meter or let me know on the spirit box or both. Is this where she's at? 
Is this where Jenny's buried? Her remains. There's no way this could all be a coincidence. The red oval below is where I parked the car when the EMF meter went off. The red line is the Carmel Etna town line. When I pulled back out onto the road, and when I drive past the sign showing the Etna town line, listen to what these spirits say. When I ask if I pass where Jenny was located, the EMF meter once again responds. Did I pass it now? Based on what the spirits said, I believe the rest of Jenny's remains are within this red square. <laughs> When James Hicks disposed of Jenny's remains, this area of land is not far from where the Hicks property sets right up the road. I believe Hicks was in a hurry to dispose of Jenny's remains and forgot Jenny's head that was in a cooler. Later he returns to the Hicks property in Etna and disposes of Jenny's head by burying it on this land. After going over documented testimony during the Hicks appeal process for the murder of Jenny, a witness testified she could hear strange sawing sounds Coming from the Hicks home in the early morning hour, James Hicks dismembered Jenny in this garage. A lot of the belongings were left behind and stored in this garage. Her body parts was put in buckets and filled with concrete. Is this tool right here is used for concrete? I have no doubt. Jenny's remains are in that location at the Carmel Etna town line. I believe they are. The problem is, I can't knock on the landowner's door and ask them if I can locate some remains that belongs to somebody because some spirits told me that they were located there. Unless law enforcement somehow takes an interest in this paranormal activity and go on that land to take a look to see if it's possible Jenny's remains are there. We can only go by what these spirits tell us at this time. I hope one day, if it's possible, to find out if Jenny's remains are on that land. I believe they are. <laughs> Looking into these murders and what serial killer James Hicks did to these women, it was dark. And I have no doubt James Hicks is possessed with pure evil. What he did is not normal human behavior. He crossed a line of normal human behavior in went into a state of pure demonic by doing what he did. But there's no doubt there are other victims. Because now these spirits are going to talk to me about these other victims. I did an investigation in Newport. I was at the Newport Historical Society. They were telling me about a school teacher that was killed in the late 1800s. And I looked up the school teacher to see if I can find out anything online, actually another school teacher came up. The school teacher who was murdered in the 1800 wasn't the only school teacher murdered in Newport. On June 1, 1975, 23-year-old school teacher Ellen Choate disappeared while in Newport. This led me right back into another investigation in the serial killer James Hicks. <laughs> Thank you.
I go to the last known location school teacher Ellen Choate was seen alive here at this service station. What these spirits say completely blew me away. Before I could ask Ellen who murdered her, these spirits knew exactly why I was there and what this investigation is about. Ellen. Ellen Choate. back in 1975. <laughs> James Hicks went by the name Jimmy. Everybody called him Jimmy. What are the odds the name Jimmy and the name Hicks would come up during a five minute investigation? I was only there five minutes. <laughs> When I heard that disembodied voice say, look at the numbers, and I heard what I heard during that investigation, I quickly knew something was going on. I wanted to quickly review the recordings and listen to what these spirits said. I went home and viewed the recordings, and sure enough, that disembodied voice that was captured, it sounded like a child that said, look at the numbers. There had to have been a reason why that spirit said that. This is when we need to listen to these spirits closely because they have information they're trying to tell us. It's up to us to fit the pieces of the puzzle together and put this information together so we understand it. These spirits were very clear. Jimmy killed Ellen. I go to the exact location where her body was found in Newport. And I conduct another investigation for confirmation about what these spirits told me so far. Like I said, I may wait a week and restart the investigation to see if these spirits will tell me the same thing. I hope to get confirmation by going back and redoing the investigation. If they tell me the same thing, it's not a coincidence. Ellen Schultz. Did James Hicks murder you? But then I received more information that convinced me coincidence do not exist and spirits will lead you down a path of information that causes a domino effect of encounters. 19 days after school teacher Ellen went missing and was murdered, another teacher was also murdered in Newport. This school teacher worked part time here, the same place Ellen was last seen alive. His name is Robert Bob McKee. When I did the investigation in the Jenny two years ago, the spirits at the house mentioned Bob was murdered during this investigation.
Because there are more victims that he killed. Are these spirits trying to tell me James Hicks murdered Bob as well? Can you tell me his name, please? I know. Is his name Jimmy Hicks? Is there something with the numbers and the dates? Ellen, what do you guys mean by look at the numbers and the dates? Are these the number and the dates that Jimmy went by to kill people? Is this what you guys wanted me to look at? Thank you. Thank you for confirming this with me. I appreciate it. If James Hicks murdered Robert Bob McKee, what would be the motive? If what these spirits are telling us is true, here is a possible scenario why Hicks would kill Robert McKee. Robert worked part-time at the service station known as the Texaco Station back in 1975. On June 1st, 1975, Ellen Choate arrives at the service station by Greyhound bus. She's on her way to Bangor to take a teaching job. This service station is also a truck stop with a restaurant. Newport is on the list of locations James Hicks worked in 1975. Is it possible James Hicks was at the service station at the same time as Ellen? Many people who knew James Hicks said he had an irresistible charm to him. Did Hicks talk with Ellen, then offered her a ride to Bangor? Was this during Robert's shift? Did Robert see Hicks and Ellen walk out the door together? Instead of taking Ellen to Bangor, did Hicks rape, beat, and strangle Ellen to death? Then dispose of her body on the Old County Road in Newport? Ellen's disappearance made the news. If Robert saw Hicks and Ellen walk out the door together... He would be able to identify James Hicks, for at this service station, this was the last place Ellen was seen alive. If Hicks knew Robert could identify him, did James Hicks return to this service station on a specific date and shot Robert three times? This would be a motive for Hicks to kill Robert. If what these spirits are telling us is true, this would be the only possible scenario to explain why Hicks killed Robert McKee. Back at the house, I continue to gather more information from these spirits in hopes to get more confirmation.
Were these murders based on the numbers? I did find another possible victim. James Hicks was a possible suspect in the murder of a 27-year-old yoga teacher, Leslie Spillman. On June 19, 1977, Leslie's body was found on a pathway in the gardens at this inn, located down East Main. I do believe there's a possible connection. Leslie is a victim of that of James Hicks. But what do these spirits mean by the numbers? Look at the numbers. What does the numbers have to do with this? What are they trying to tell us? I spent weeks looking into the life of serial killer James Hicks trying to make sense out of all of this. Are these spirits sending us on a wild goose chase? Or is there some kind of mathematical formula to the madness of James Hicks? After carefully doing research, this is what I found. When James Hicks was 23 years old, Jenny files for divorce, but later dropped the divorce. She was pregnant with their second child. 23 days after 23-year-old Ellen remains were found, 23-year-old Jenny was murdered on July 19, 1977. Exactly one month to the date, Leslie's body was found June 19, 1977. 23 years after James Hicks murdered Jenny, Hicks confesses to the murders of Jenny, Gerilyn Tower, and Lynn Willette. Seven years after James and Jenny were married, on 7-19-1977, Hicks murders Jenny. Seven years after Hicks murders Jenny, he murders Gerilyn Towers in Newport, the same town Ellen and Robert was murdered in. Seven days after Leslie Spillman's body was found, Ellen Choate's remains were found in Newport. James Hicks was 19 years old when he married Jenny. Also at 19, James Hicks' first child was born. Leslie Spillman was murdered on June 19th, Jenny July 19th. 19 days after Ellen was murdered, Robert McKee was murdered. After doing extensive research into paranormal encounters over the years, I have found numbers and dates play a major factor of these supernatural encounters, and these numbers and dates are not a coincidence. In most cases, serial killers will have a calling card, how and why they murder. When law enforcement investigates a string of murders, and the evidence shows similarities one to another, this is when they know a string of murders are the works of a serial killer. Profilers come in. They must look carefully into the evidence and hope to find the serial killer's calling card in order to identify the suspect. Once a suspect's calling card or motives are established, they are able to solve the case. I personally believe James Hicks was likely demonically influenced, possessed by pure evil. <laughs> And by investigating this evil, I encountered this evil that influenced him to commit such acts. I also believe the lady in Etna who knew James Hicks and the evil that possessed him, she warned me not to get involved. The moment I mentioned James Hicks, she went into a complete panic. If the numbers are in fact the calling card of James Hicks, if there are other victims, could these numbers connect James Hicks to other unsolved murders? What are these spirits trying to tell us? All of these encounters so far within the first year, definitely proved to me 
just how real this paranormal activity is. But these investigations are just barely getting started. I'm barely scratching the surface into these encounters. They get much deeper. Like a frog in boiling water, the paranormal temperatures are slowly rising. You don't realize just how hot the water has become until one day you look back and remember the cooler temperatures. I think they know that I know that they're here. This whole village of Carmel has a story to tell. Where's your body laid to rest at? And they start communicating more often now that they know I understand that they're here in this house. Edmund Lamb, are you in here? Can you give me the names of anyone who are buried in this basement? And some of them just want to cuss me out. I guess they don't have anybody to cuss out, so uh, they want to cuss me out. I just heard some talking. Is there somebody buried here in this basement? Listen, I was going to continue to do the spirit box session, but after I heard that, and it was time for me to get out of there. It could be something worse. I don't know. Hello? What's the matter? This is stupid. And... What the hell is that noise? Oh my god, I don't want... Come here. Kitty, you want to go up to my room?